to the Fall Honors Lecture Series on the 50th anniversary of the Honors College, the history of our college. Uh, I have the pleasure today of, of introducing one of the greatest resources on this campus, and certainly greatest, one of the greatest resources in our college, uh, uh, someone who works tirelessly with our students to help them achieve their goals, uh, goals that they have or goals that they haven't even thought about, possibilities that they haven't even thought about. Come on in. Um, and that person is Laura Clifford, who has for over 25 years uh, worked in higher education. She currently serves in the Honors College as the National and International Fellowships Advisor. So she does this for our college and she does it for the university as a whole. MTSU has a high percentage of first generation and low income students. Her past employment includes 15 years of service with TRIO where she worked with low income first generation and disabled students. Laura has served as a non-certifying Gilman advisor, Fulbright program advisor, and critical language scholarship campus advisor for the last 15 years. She served as a selection panelist for the Gilman program, CLS, and Phi Kappa Phi study abroad scholarships. She conducts over 45 workshops per year related to studying abroad and to fellowships, including Gilman workshops. Her focus is on helping students learn from the application experience regardless of the outcome. Past leadership activities include four years of service on the National Association Fellowships Advisors Executive Board. She was awarded an IEA Fulbright to Japan in 2019 after years of helping students get Fulbrights to study abroad and to do research abroad. She's also served on the JET interview panel for the Consulate General of Japan in Nashville. And I'll remind everyone that if you're available after class today that we're having uh, an information session about our Honors in Italy program. And our speaker today, Lord Clifford, is the person you want to talk to if you're interested in applying for fellowships that would help you uh, with your expenses, either studying abroad or studying away, whether in our programs or in any study abroad program we have at the university. Please join me in welcoming Mark Clifton. So I'm really excited to be here today. My biggest concern is I may run out of time. So there, there are more fellowships in this PowerPoint than we can get to. So for running short of time, I think we have till five till or ten till? Five till. Five till. Um, I want to allow at least a few minutes for questions, so at that point I may say you can go to the website, the information is there. Because I have three students here who have been through the fellowship process and have been successful. And I want to give time for you to hear their stories and I want to inspire you to know that fellowships are not something that is out of reach. So, um, just a little background, this is a lecture series about history, okay? So Michelle Arnold was our first fellowship advisor. She was here for four years, and Dr. <coughs> Phil Mathis was the inspiration. <coughs> I have been here for 15 years, as mentioned before, worked with first-generation low-income students. Um, really blessed because they hired two extra advisors allowing me to dive deeper into the world of fellowships and my office is upstairs and I, I just love doing this. <laughs> so we have people that win this, okay? So I'm not going to take time to explain what all of these are, but for example, the Gilman Scholarship um, pays up to $8,000 to study abroad and we've had over 82 people win. And the NSF, REUs, which are for STEM folks to get paid in the summer, we've had over 57 people win. So these scholarships are very obtainable and doable. Um, here's some more winners. So uh, it's a lot of fun to apply, and I'll talk about the process if time allows. 
So uh, just a little bit of history. Phi Kappa Phi has uh, been around at MTSU for quite a long time, okay? Um, there's been a lot of meaningful work put into it by Dean Bile, uh, Philip Phillips, um, David Foote, and others. And Phi Kappa Phi has all kinds of opportunities. Um, we've been very fortunate to have students win $8,500 for graduate school, um, money for study abroad, money from global learning. And so the journey of Phi Kappa Phi has been the journey of the fellowships as well. The, the Fulbright program, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about Fulbright, but Fulbright's mission is really world peace, okay? So this happened after World War II, and MTSU has been recognized historically as being a top producer in 2012, okay? We were named one of the top producers in the nation. I typically work with anywhere from 11 to 15 students, and we've had, there's different types of Fulbrights, but we've had 26 winners in terms of the longer Fulbright where you stay overseas after graduation. Um, the science fellowships. The Goldwater um, Scholarship has historically done well here at MTSU. Goldwater is where you go into a research career by earning a PhD. And we've had roughly 18 people become winners or honorable mentions. Um, and then I want to mention Dr. Drew C. Okay? So uh, Dean Vile and Dr. Phillips had the vision um, to hire him. And he really kind of inspired the Honors College to get more involved in the STEM world. So an REU is an opportunity to get paid rough, usually around an average of $6,000 during the summer, all your expenses to do research at another institution. And so his participation in our college historically really pushed us forward. <coughs> Um, so, yes, historically, we had our first Gilman Scholar in 2020. The critical language is where you study less popular languages, not typically like German and Spanish, but like Portuguese, Hindi, and other languages. We've had about 15 students. Um, the Wrangell Scholarship is tied to uh, being a, a foreign service officer. We had a student in 2013, and Tandra Martin, you were here for Tandra. Tandra was a foreign scholar in 2014. So roughly the scholarships are divided into four categories. So there's public policy, study abroad or international, STEM, and then this and more. And this and more is quite extensive, okay? So I don't want to minimize that. Um, when you go to the website, there's probably over 200 different fellowships. And so when I say we may run out of time, you may need to look on the website or schedule an appointment, it's because I want to allow time for speakers and not just read things to you, okay? But we help match students to scholarships, we help them apply, um, and we help them prepare for their interviews. So let's talk about the Gilman Scholarship, okay? The Gilman Scholarship is um, for students with limited means to study abroad. Um, any student with a Pell Grant, any student with a Pell Grant, and roughly 45% of our students have a Pell Grant, can get money for any study abroad. And it is through the State Department. There's also Phi Kappa Phi. As I mentioned, they have money for graduate school and study abroad. Um, they have a lot of, these fellowships are very specific. You do not have to be a member of Phi Kappa Phi to apply for the Phi Kappa Phi Study Abroad Scholarship. Okay, that's a, like an exception that they make. Um, and that, we've had quite a few students um, get those awards. And so I'd like to bring first our guest speaker, um, JL, and she is just going to sort of talk about the process that she went through. Cool. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is JL Guest, and I'm a French major with minors in Arabic and linguistics at MTSU. I'm a junior and a Buchanan scholar. Um, and also an honors ambassador this year. Um, so I completed a year, two semesters, in France last year at the Université de Caen, um, which is in Normandy. And we have a pretty solid exchange program with that school, which meant that things like my Pell Grant and my Buchanan tuition applied to cover tuition. But 
As you may know, study abroad involves more costs than just the tuition of the school that you're going to. And so I um, applied for many scholarships with the help of Flora to um, be able to pay for my flights and travel expenses and food and other, other things like that. So I won the Gilman, and I also won the Phi Kappa Phi, and I also won the Fund for Education Abroad, which he didn't mention, but it's a sizable, uh, it's 5000 a semester. Um, so um, the way, the, the thing I'm talking about today is just how those enabled me to have the best possible experience, because um, without those, I wouldn't have been able to do all the extra travel that I did. Uh, I went to Italy, I went to Belgium, I went to Switzerland, um, I went to Germany twice, um, and uh, I also got to explore a lot of North France. So that there's me and some of my best friends at Claude Monet's house, which I saw in the fall and in the spring, so different flowers both times. Um, and then that's the city I was in, Caen, um, and I miss it so much. That's also <laughs> Caen. And then that's the Louvre, everybody knows what that is. <laughs> um, but so uh, one thing that made my time really unique was the Speak 14 program, which paired uh, international students at the university with local middle schools. And so I became an assistant English teacher, and um, I miss all those kids very dearly. But it was kind of another angle for um, cultural uh, and linguistic exchange, because my professor, the professors of English, would be like, OK, so in American English, how does this work? Or is it true that in America they do this? And I would explain to the best of my ability, and then I would experience things in my daily life, and I'd go to them and say, is this a French thing, or is this like a weird thing that I experienced? <laughs> um, so, uh, and then of course, I actually learned more about French by hearing the little kids try to speak English, if that makes sense. If any of you are language learners, um, the way that they would put their syntax would give me clues to how French works. Mm -hmm. um, so really amazing experience. Um, and that was actually paid, like it was a paid job. Um, but beyond that, um, I would not have been able to travel as much as I did without the Gilman and the Phi Kappa Phi. Um, and then another amazing thing about the Gilman is you have to do a project. And I decided to blog. And uh, the blogging experience did help me um, process my experiences because a year is a long time. Um, and part of my project was also speaking to you. So mm -hmm. this is part of my project. Mm -hmm. um, and so my big thing about study abroad is what I tell everybody is it doesn't matter if you are a language major or a culture major, whatever that would be. Like you're, if you're in international politics, of course it's useful. If you're in global studies, it's useful. But it's useful to everybody because study abroad is such a formative experience no matter who you are, and um, everything that you have to, all the challenges that you face, it was challenging, there are many challenges I could talk about, um, but um, the you just gain so much like independence and leadership skills and adaptability and all those things that are applicable to any field. Um, and I also, uh, one amazing thing that happened to me was career direction. So I, before I got to France, I knew I wanted to be fluent in Arabic and French, but then I had a professor um, who taught us historical linguistics of French, which is how French became a language. And that became my passion, so now I'm pursuing a PhD in linguistics with an emphasis on historical and sociolinguistics. So he kind of gave me my direction. And I'm still taking Latin via Zoom with him this fall. <laughs> um, so the kinds of relationships that you build and the experiences and the overcoming all the struggles, those are things that anybody can benefit from. And it's possible, I was a Pell Grant recipient, but I managed to go without any of my own money, which is crazy. Um, so, yeah, that's my experiences. And we will allow time for questions at the end. So, let's talk about the UK Summer Institute. Now, the thing about these fellowships is they are very, very specific. So this particular fellowship, they, uh, the students spend three to four weeks overseas. They look for freshmen and sophomore, OK? So not by hours, but by, is this your first year at the university or your second year? But they have a strong preference with people that have little or no study abroad experience, OK? 
Uh, it's very, very competitive, and I have joked with Victoria that if I had told her how competitive it was, she would have run away. And she would not have applied. But she did apply, and she did win it. She uh, was the third MTSU student to get the UK Summer Institute. So I'm going to let Victoria tell you about her experience. Okay, hello, everyone. So uh, Ms. Clifford asked me to come speak to you today a little bit about my experience with the Undergraduate Fellowships Office in Fulbright. And before I begin, I wanted to thank her for inviting me to come out today. So last spring semester, I was awarded a spot in the US-UK Fulbright Summer Institute program to Aberystwyth University in Wales, the United Kingdom. So a little bit about me, I believe it's up here, but I'll kind of talk about that. Um, I'm a sophomore here at MTSU, and I'm majoring in political science and German, and I have minors in economics and university honors. So I'll start by talking a little bit about the application process itself, um, the experience, and the benefits I've enjoyed afterward when I come back to MTSU. So last January, I received an email from our undergraduate fellowships office from Ms. Clifford about an opportunity to study abroad with the Fulbright program in the summer. Being such a prestigious program, I, um, I was kind of scared about that. The application process was super long, lots of essays involved. I didn't feel really confident enough or prepared to go overseas so early in my college career. And I didn't think, oh, it's such a prestigious program. I was like, oh, there's no way I could get that. Um, I think the requirements were a little bit on the last slide, but I'll talk about that. So you have to be either a freshman or a sophomore have a 3.75 GPA or higher, never been out of the country before, and they did include a preference in there for low-income students. And I will say, if I'm correct, applications open tomorrow for that. So um, the spec these specifications really interested me because I was like, wow, that seems like it's listing off some of the things I might meet, and I was like, that's a great opportunity to study abroad. So Ms. Clifford offered to meet with me. At almost weekly to brush up on my application and she got several of our honors college faculty and staff members to critique my materials over and over again just really polish those up additionally they directed me to our amazing students at the University Writing Center who read over my materials for any grammatical er errors and extra polishing it truly felt like a shot in the dark and I had no expectations of being awarded a spot in the program but with the help from the Undergraduate Fellowships Office, the Honors College, and our Libraries University Writing Center, um, I, got, I became a semi-finalist in March, I believe, and then they contacted me and scheduled an interview. So after being awarded an interview, Ms. Clifford did two mock interviews with me, and she even contacted some of our previous two uh, MTSU winners to practice questions with me, and that was super helpful, made me feel prepared when that interview started. So although I was nervous, I had my interview on the 19th of April this year, and I felt pretty confident, definitely really nervous, but confident to do it. About a week later, I received an email that I had been accepted to the program. So the Undergraduate Fellowships Office help did not stop with my application. Ms. Clifford organized meetings for me with MTSU faculty familiar with the UK, and they answered all the burning questions I had about um, how to get there, what to bring with me, how to dress, anything I was thinking about. And having never been out of the country, these meetings really eased my travel worries so that when I got on that plane to Nashville, I felt confident and ready to go. So arriving in the UK was a truly surreal experience. The journey was long, very long and difficult, but immediately forming a bond with my fellow participants in the airport and then seeing the beautiful Welsh uh, coastline on the Irish Sea, which I believe is a little bit pictured up there, lots of pictures of the beach. Um, it all made that journey really worthwhile. So the program began Monday after we arrived, had a weekend to ourselves, and this included several trips to Welsh historical sites, lectures over the identity and nationhood of the Welsh, and Welsh language lessons, which I will not say a word in Welsh because I don't feel confident in that, not very much. <laughs> Uh, we also got to participate in a lot of activities, including seeing Carnaphron Castle, which is where the Princes of Wales, that later become the British Kings, are their crown there. Um, we also got to have a sit-down meeting with Parliament member Ben Lake from the Welsh Nationalist Party, Plaid Cymru. I can say that in Welsh, Plaid Cymru. And my favourite, I think I hit a button. Can I go back? There we go. 
and my favorite opportunity was getting to go to a original Iron Age village in the UK, and we got to dress up in this ancient guard slingshot rocks at a little cutout of goat <laughs> and make bread over a fire. That was that was interesting. Um, there were also We're some. <laughs> was good. There are also some challenges uh, with all this fun stuff. Uh, for example, I lost my luggage for the first week, but Miss Clifford had prepared me for that. She said, it will definitely not happen to you, but it could, so here's what you do. And it happened, but I made it through. <laughs> I made it through, it was great. But um, actually I had to go down there to the store by myself and get stuff. So good character building, a little bit of good challenges there. <laughs> Um, but the greatest thing was, besides all those fun activities, was getting to make so many friends that I'm still in contact with. So the seven other Americans that were with me, I'm still talking to them. There were two Canadians with us, surprise, we didn't know they were going to be there, but that was great. And we also had two British mentors that became some of the closest people I've ever known, even though they're obviously in the UK still, but they were great. And also just getting to meet so many British locals on our excursions, and everybody was absolutely so nice. It was great. But ultimately, the U.S.-U.K. Fulbright Summer Institute has been the highlight of my college career and my life so far. Coming back to MTSU this fall, I feel more confident in myself and ready to tackle challenges. I felt myself becoming more of a leader after the experience, and I've taken on a lot of different roles here on campus in different organizations. And I'm hoping this experience isn't something I soon will forget. I hope this drive I maintain. I'm planning to go study abroad this summer, hopefully in Germany. And I don't think that I would feel confident to do that if I didn't have this experience. Because going to a place with a foreign language and having to survive for a couple weeks, I don't think I could do it without this. So yeah, um, this experience, though, would not have been possible without the Undergraduate Fellowships Office in Ms. Clifford. From the long application, extensive interview, and challenges of the program, I would not have been able to do it without the help of Ms. Clifford and our other faculty here. I urge you all to get to know all the different programs available to you from MTSU on our website, and make an appointment with the Undergraduate Fellowships Office, office if that's something that's interesting you. So I'll end this off by saying thank you Ms. Clifford, the Honors College, and all of you for having me today. Um, so there's different types of opportunities. There are some res research-based opportunities. So one of the research-based opportunities is associated with the full fight. This is after you graduate, you go overseas, and you do usually independent research for 8 to 12 months, okay? Um, they do also have graduate school options available for the full fight. Uh, this is a program that is in Canada. So Fulbright has expanded itself. There's the summer Fulbright, there's the after graduation Fulbright. But this one um, is you go to Canada during the summer, you have to have at least three semesters left, okay? Uh, and then you get paid uh, and you get to do research with a professor in Canada. So it's a really good opportunity for students. Uh, as I mentioned before, the National Science Foundation has opportunities as well, and those are the REUs, and uh, my daughter was fortunate enough to do two of those, and she personally got paid $6,000 and got to do research they paid for travel and housing. Now, some of the fellowships I, I mentioned, like, oh, you have to be this or you have to be that. Uh, you don't have to be low income or have a Pell Grant or anything like that for the REUs. Um, I've had students of all different backgrounds get these. And then there are language opportunities. Along with the research, there is the teaching Fulbright, and we've had probably the most of those. Typically, you're in the classroom acting as an English teacher. Now, as, as Victoria uh, and Jail were talking about, there's more opportunities than I can talk about. So there's also the JET, which is teaching in Japan, and there's a lot more opportunities. The Freeman Asia um, is an opportunity associated with Asia, and it is an opportunity associated with learning languages as well. Uh, and we have a Freeman Asia winner here as well. So for the Freeman Asia, um, you can get up to $12,000. Um, obviously, you have to be in Asia, and you have to have a 2.8 GPA. So Rachel, please come.
again, everybody. My name is Rachel Brewer. Um, I was a Freeman Asia recipient. Um, it is now. I'm also an Honors Buchanan Transfer Fellow, a senior, majoring in Japanese language and minoring in Global Studies, Honors, and English. So, I guess since this is the history of uh, fellowships and scholarships, I guess I can just rewind a little bit to tell you about my experience with the Undergraduate Fellowship Office. Um, I am a returning adult student, so I guess non-traditional. Um, I came back to school at MTSU in 2019, and immediately I knew that scholarships and grants and financial aid were going to be super essential for me. As someone who dropped from a $40,000 a year income to $16,000 a year, I had to figure out a way to not only survive, but survive and pay for school. So Ms. Clifford and the undergraduate office has been an essential and crucial um, element to my study here at MTSU. I think that it was probably within the first semester I probably met with mm -hmm. you to discuss opportunities and scholarships available on this campus. Um, so fast forward, COVID-19 pandemic hit. I was originally supposed to study abroad in Japan in the summer of 2020. We all know what happened in 2020. Um, I applied to Kansai Gaide another three times, and it got postponed another three times. And so over and over again, I was like, you know what, I'm just not going to give up. I think that, and then the, 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 the catcher with all of this was in the spring of 2022, I received the Freeman Asia Scholarship. But my program got postponed, which meant I couldn't use it. However, I reapplied, and with the aid of Ms. Clifford and refilling out the application and going through um, the process, editing the essay, resubmitting the materials, they awarded me again the Freeman Asia Scholarship to be able to go and study in Japan. Um, at first for a single semester, but when I left on August 18th to go to Japan, and I landed in that airport, and I had to stay and wait for the bus to come pick me up, and I arrived at the dorm, and I walked into the opening ceremony in that first week, I knew in my heart that I needed to stay longer if I could. And so, thanks to additional scholarships, applying all the way from Japan, and um, the assistance that I received back and forth, despite the time difference of, what, 15 hours, um, I was able to stay in Japan for 11 months. Um, my study abroad took place at Kansai Gaire Daigaku, um, or Kansai Gaire University in Osaka, Japan. We were nestled in a nice little city called Hirakata City. Um, it's about 30 minutes both from Osaka and Kyoto. So it was a really opportunistic place to stay and do my study abroad because I had access to so many different places um, in Japan. Um, I studied a lot of different things, um, not just in the classroom, but I joined a lot of clubs. Um, I joined the volunteer club, I joined an Ikebana club and learned about flower arrangement. Um, part of my volunteering actually included going to an elementary school, a Japanese elementary school, once a week on Wednesdays where I assisted the elementary school students with their English homework, and then if we got finished in time, we would play games. <laughs> and some of them, and part of the culture exchange there was like, sometimes we would play um, Japanese games, and then sometimes we would play games that I played when I was a kid. And so um, hide and seek was really hard for me in an elementary school. I think I was a coder. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was, it's those experiences that I would not have been able to experience without the financial aid that was provided to me. I am also a person who was able to go and study abroad in Japan for 11 months and owe nothing. Um, I received all of my um, aid to be able to do that. Um, I didn't have to pay anything out of pocket other than probably my, my, my souvenirs <laughs> that I brought back for my family. Um, but among other things that I did in Japan, um, I took a haiku composition workshop, if any of you um, know. Um, Dr. Phillips was my thesis director. Um, I wrote a thesis on the influences of haiku and the writings of Gary Snyder, and so part of my um, study in Japan involved, well, I'm going to be in Japan. I want to follow up on that study and learn more about haiku. And so I learned from haiku poets how to start composing haiku in Japanese. I've only composed a few. I'm not very good yet, but I've composed several in English, so I'm working on it. Um, I went hiking up holy mountains, such as Mount Hiei. Um, I didn't um, make it to Koyasan, but I did get almost half, 
over halfway up Mount Fuji before I came home. I made the mistake of climbing from the bottom up, and that took about 10 hours. <laughs> but, um, you know, those types of experiences were just, they're lifelong. They're not going to go away. They're always going to stay with me. I traveled to over 20 cities in Japan, and I hit every main island in Japan. Hokkaido, uh, Honshu, Kyushu, Shikoku, um, as far south as Okinawa, and as far north as Otaru and Sapporo City. Um, I even hopped over to South Korea during Golden Week for a couple days because I wanted to exp experience a different culture in Asia. Um, I know no Korean whatsoever. And, and it was definitely a complete 180 from what I was used to in Japan, but it was, again, another amazing experience. Um, one of the things that I had to do for my Freeman Asia scholarship is I had to, you have to do what's called a service project. Um, I was lucky because mine was finished today at 2 p.m. at the printers. Um, <laughs> my project originally um, entailed a visual journal. Um, where I was going to record my experiences, day-to-day -day life activities, um, in a journal, take photos, pair them with the photos, and then write haiku um, and pair those with photos as well. Well, since I stayed for more than one semester, I decided to incorporate the spring semester as well. And with an 11-month stay in Japan, I just felt like I needed to go to the next level for my project. So I ended up converting my journal into a digital format. I designed every single page individually and ended up making this booklet um, that is now a tangible physical copy of um, my experiences in Japan. And, and granted, this is a summary, <laughs> but I tried to pick the most memorable experiences that I had um, in Japan and just meticulously thinking about the colors and the layout what I would say, how I would remember, how would I want to pass on these emotions and these feelings and these memories to the people that would read this book. So I'm going to pass this around the room. Feel free to just, you know, peruse it, look at it, and it's not required to read the whole thing. It's, it's 47 pages long. Um, <laughs> but I'll go ahead and start here. Um, that is a requirement of the Freeman Asia Scholarship. You do have to do a service project. You don't necessarily have to do exactly what I did, though. Um, but I do suggest that because a study abroad experience is taking you to the next level, that your service project should also be something similar. Taking yourself to the next level and branching out. I am not tech savvy at all, but I learned technology so I could do something like this. Expanding my knowledge of things that I didn't know before. And now I have a priceless memory that will not only be passed on to me, but it will also be passed on to all of you and anyone else who reads it in the future. So again, I encourage you to make use of the Undergraduate Fellowships Office. Um, they are an extremely crucial, important resource for you. Um, and so thank you for listening and having me today. And Rachel will be at the Education Abroad Fair, which is this Wednesday. Uh, I think she said she would let us keep uh, her, her book there. Mm -hmm. And you'll be I'll there. Bring from about an hour? I will bring it to the uh, cultural fair on Wednesday. I'll be there from 11 to 2. And I'm okay. also speaking at the study abroad symposium this Saturday. OK, so for more opportunities for, for you to learn. Uh, the Critical Language Scholarship uh, closed today, I believe. Closes uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm submitting today, so I know. Um, and it allows students to uh, study various languages. Uh, the, the CLS actually has, they, they, they have expanded, uh, they have this, what they call the CLS Spark, which are, there are three languages that you can study virtually, um, but the regular CLS is you go overseas and you study um, these languages for, for a few weeks during the summer. Um, there's also, again, just a summary, uh, we have something called a Udall Scholarship, which is re related to environmental issues or Native American. Uh, and it's for people that are very passionate about those kinds of issues. So they're service-related projects. Um, the Truman is a lot of fun. And I always say that I'm looking for someone who has really strong opinions for the Truman. Um, it pays $30,000 for graduate school. Um, and you typically apply when you're a junior. And you're involved in government. You're involved on campus. Um, and you want to uh, make some changes 
uh, in our society. The public policy is uh, they have service weekends, but they also have summer opportunities to learn about careers related to political science and public policy and that type of thing. Uh, their institute uh, is amazing. I think this, if you remember Tandra Martin, she did the, the public policy um, at Carnegie Mellon, and she said it was very instrumental. So in general, you need to keep track of what you do. Your system for keeping track can be scraps of paper or your phone, but when it comes time to write your essays, you know, and you know, Dr. Phillips said, well, yeah, Laura got the Fulbright. I was rejected. I applied for the Fulbright for South Korea, and why I was rejected. Um, but a couple years later, I applied for Japan, and I did get it. But when I sat down to look at my essays, I wanted to tell you, it was a five-page single-space essay, and I thought, I've been doing this for ten years at this point, and I thought, what the heck am I supposed to write here, you know? <laughs> so, but I had a resume, I had information, I had stories. So you want to keep track of not just, okay, I volunteered at the blood drive, but because you volunteered at the blood drive, you got 10 of your buddies to come and help you recruit, and you had a 50% more donation rate, okay? So you want to talk about how you got involved and how you made a difference, whatever it is. And you want to ask people, ask your faculty, ask your advisors about things, and pursue things that you care about. So people will, you know, occasionally students will say, what do I do to strengthen my resume this semester? I'm like, that's the wrong question. What do you care about? Do you care about English? Do you care about STEM? What do you care about? So that's what you should pursue. Um, you know, some things, uh, I always joke that there's a way to tell whether students will do well or not, and typically it's if they check their emails and they start the process early, although we have had people who procrastinate a little, a little bit and win these things as well. But in general, read the directions. Before you start pounding away at the questions, take an hour or two and reflect deeply. Okay. It really also helps to take criticism well. So uh, when I reapplied for my Fulbright, I gave it to one advisor who wasn't on campus, and she said, you've, you've talked three paragraphs about yourself, but you haven't mentioned Fulbright at all. Okay. So be open to that process. And then I always tell students, go to the writing center. Take it to your faculty. Take it to your mother, your brother. It takes a village to make something strong. So I always pick on the deans. So recommendations. What is the shortest period of time you actually wrote a recommendation? Probably 24 hours. 24 hours. But I wouldn't advise it. <laughs> Same here. Yeah. So give them a month. Yeah. If you want a decent letter, if you want a letter that really digs in to what your strengths are, give them a lot of time. Tell them what you're applying for. Give them the website, give them your resume, because that your faculty really care and they want to do a good job, but they need that time. Personal statement. Everybody wants one, okay? And I would say 95% of students do not like this, okay? They want to write about they want to write about their major, but they don't want to write by themselves, okay? So this is asking you, okay, you want to be a doctor? Because you want to help people? Don't, don't all doctors help people? Tell me more, okay? So a personal statement really digs into how you became the person that you are, and you have to give stories and example. And this is probably the majority of the time that I spend with people, is just kind of trying to pull information out. A CV versus a resume, okay? There are, I found out there's nine people in the Career Development Center, okay? If you don't have a CV or a resume, they have a Dropbox, they can help you. Basically, the CV is a little bit more focused on your educational experiences, and typically, it's allowed to be a little bit longer, okay? But I would recommend, you don't have to struggle through this alone. If you don't have one or you just want to improve it, I recommend you use their services. And lastly, I always tell students that, that fellowships is a process um, not a destination. So I want students to learn from just the application process. So years ago we had a student who 
did not win the gold water. And I said, I'm really sorry you didn't win, because they really tried. They really did a lot of essays. They said, don't be sorry. I used those same essays. I got into graduate school with them. I got a summer internship at MIT. So going through that intellectual process of developing yourself can help strengthen your writing. It can help strengthen you just personally if you want to uh, apply for other things professionally. Um, and so what do we do? What do I do? We um, help students find fellowships. Our website's pretty extensive. Uh, we have videos. We have a list of places that you can live overseas. There's a STEM database. There's a lot of information there. Um, I realize it's pretty intimidating, so I can do individual meetings. I can do Zoom or I can meet in person and that type of thing.